So I am a family physician. I've uh, practiced for 30 years. Um, I have a, uh, a, a complete family practice. I deal with pediatrics, um, uh, adults, geriatric medicine. Um, I've been in St. Albert uh, for 25 years. I began in, in Lethbridge where I spent five years. Um, for a large part of my uh, practice, uh, about 15 years, I was uh, doing uh, tertiary pain work. So I saw a lot of individuals with um, uh, chronic pain disorders, um, some of the worst uh, conditions that we treat as physicians. Um, so I had to deal a lot with patient suffering and how we kind of deal and alleviate that suffering. Um, now I'm not doing as much pain though. I'm back in the, in the chronic, uh, uh, I mean, the family uh, physician um, realm and, and again, dealing with um, basically the, the general things we'll see in family practice. And um, you're, can I ask if you're Catholic? Uh, yes, I am. A, I am a practicing uh, evangelical Roman Catholic. I love my faith and uh, I love uh, talking about my faith. It's a very important part of my, um, my clinical practice. Um, my um, my uh, office uh, has crucifixes as, as does my uh, exam rooms and I make it quite, uh, I make it, it, it quite obvious that this is a, this is a Christian office. That being said, um, the issues around Bill C-7 have very broad ramifications to me as a physician that go way beyond my faith. And I think this is important. I mean, we can, we can, you know, look at this as a faith issue, but um, I think it then makes it sort of narrow when it comes to what's going on in the healthcare system. And I think there's very big, broader issues that I think will unite physicians right across Canada, whether or not they're, you know, people of faith, um, other religions other than Christians, and, and just even uh, people who have no faith at all, um, because this is, this is a really big issue. Okay. Um, were you surprised that uh, um, Bill C-7 was passed? Yeah, I actually very surprised. Um, I was involved with a number of, of groups that were actively lobbying um, against the passage of, of Bill C-7. Um, a number of, uh, of my colleagues were involved in the uh, Senate hearings, um, and I thought they made very compelling arguments. Um, everything I read um, from um, my colleagues uh, across Canada seemed to suggest to me that there was a very strong grassroots movement of physicians who were opposed to this. And, this included physicians from all specialties, um, including uh, uh, family physicians and psychiatrists, um, particularly the psychiatrists who were very concerned about some of the potential ramifications on mental health illness. So when I thought saw this kind of uh, groundswell of, of, su of support for not passage uh, of this bill uh, in its current form, and then it was passed, it was, I just didn't know what to think. It, it really was, it really caught me off guard in many ways. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, what is, what is the Coles Notes version of, uh, uh, of Bill C-7? It, it, uh, um, it expands the criteria for uh, assisted suicide, right? Right. So um, the, the Coles Notes version is that um, a number of years ago uh, through a case in Quebec, um, it was uh, thrown to Parliament that the current uh, bill um, that was, uh, had been going on for a few years in terms of um, uh, what is euphemistically called medical assistance in dying or made um, was not, um, not uh, constitutional and they needed to redevelop the laws. And so what Bill C-7 did is it took made from being um, something offered to people with a foreseeable death um, to an expansion that included virtually every illness that we see in medicine that is chronic, incurable, and causes suffering. So this is a large swath of illnesses from severe osteoarthritis, bad uh, emphysema, um, chronic pain disorders, um, mental health disorders, although mental health disorders have been postponed in the bill for you know two years it is still clearly where where things are going to go at that after that period of two years to kind of study the issue a bit more but clearly the legislation is going to affect mental health illness as well to the point and i think this is really the um you know if you want the uh, the take home on this it really is 
I, and I heard a, a physician comment on this, so I won't claim this to myself, but w- what we've done is we've taken medical assistance in dying, in dying and now made it into medical assistance in death. So in the medical assistance in dying idea was these people were dying, they were palliative. I had concerns about that as it were, as you can imagine. Um, I believe that the answer for that group is better palliative care. But irrespective, you've taken it from being medical assistance in dying to medical assistance in death. We are now being asked as physicians in this country to take the lives of individuals where death is not in the foreseeable future. And in fact, death may not be in, in you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years if these people were allowed to continue to live their lives. That is, that is a fundamental shift in the way we practice as physicians. Um, what would you say to, to those that, uh, uh, that say, you know, number one, it's, it's available in, in, in other countries. Uh, number two, uh, the government didn't have much of a choice because it had to comply with the, the court ruling. And uh, um, uh, why should this not be, a, be an option? I mean, you, you, um, you, you make your points as a, uh, as a physician and a Catholic, but what if I'm uh, not Catholic? Why uh, should the government deny me this as an option if I'm um, suffering so uh, egregiously? Yeah. Well, those are fabulous points. I think this goes back to fundamentally what you know where do we stand right now in this country when it comes to medical care to deal with people with chronic illness i think the issue for us as physicians is that there is still a lack of funding and accessibility for proper treatment of many of these con- these conditions if and and you know from a purely medical point of view not a not a maybe theological point of view if we could argue that um, we have access to all treatments. Uh, you know, patients um, have access to all treatments. Um, it's, it's, again, readily, readily accessible, well-funded, and a patient has gone through all those treatments and nothing has worked and they want to access medical assistance in, in dying. Okay, maybe we can have that discussion. I personally still believe that would be wrong, but we can have that discussion. I think the problem here is that we're putting the cart before the horse. We're not funding accessibility to all these other important uh, treatment options and programs um, and rather just saying, hey, let's, let's just do this when there's a lot of great treatments out there. I'll give you one example. So in Canada right now, opioids for chronic pain are an option that is, is considered um, controversial. In fact, in many jurisdictions, patients are being taken off opioid painkillers for their chronic pain disorder. Now, I'm not here to say that opioids work all the time in in chronic pain patients, but there is clearly a proportion of patients that opioids do work. So we're in this very interesting situation right now, as it stands today, that we can take these patients off these opioids that for many people, they feel are helping them lead them to more suffering. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this personally happen in in my practice where people were doing well and they were denied this treatment for whatever reason and offer them made now. So here we have a treatment that's going to keep them going, relieve their suffering. This is no longer considered acceptable, but offering them medical assistance in in death, shall I call it now, um, is acceptable, which is egregious, which is egregious. The other thing that really bothers me about this is where is the fight in my profession? When I did chronic pain management and I saw a patient for the first time, often in a crisis at the point of, um, I don't want to go on, Dr. Hopman, this pain is too much, I'm suffering too much. It could take me up to two years to get that patient better. And it would take a lot lot of my effort, a lot of time, a lot of education, a lot of um, uh, flexibility, almost always to men and women, we would get people better and they would, they would see hope again. You know, when you take a look at Bill C-7, you've got a 90-day window. And if after that 90-day window of trying to help these people, they still feel that they're suffering and they want to access made, they, they will be able to access that, that option. Well, no guys, 
you know, that's, that's too easy. You, you're, you're, you're not really exploring all the options because it takes time to make people with chronic illness better. And it takes time to access all the specialists and all the programs to, to really help these individuals. And I contend that, that if we give these people the best possible medical care that we can offer in the 21st century in Canada, these patients get better. They get hopeful. They, they, they see the light and their suffering is a bit easier to deal with. So again, I, I, I personally think, you know, that, 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 that made is, is, is a, is a cop out from in many ways in our society. It, it keeps us from doing the right thing for our patients and it keeps us from, from, um, you know, you know, pouring money into programs that I guess, you know, maybe, you know, are, we're getting to the point in our society that's an economic thing, which is, which is a sad way to look at life. So, um, and just to clarify, do you see uh, MAID as a, um, uh, an option at all, or should it be uh, outlawed uh, completely? Okay. So personally, I feel I, as, a, as a physician, I would not see MAID as an option as all, at, at all. Now, I do understand I live in a, in a society that, um, you know, legislature legislate certain rights to people. Um, and, um, you know, you know I, I respect the culture to some extent. I think that, um, you know, as a personal practicing physician, the idea of me even being involved in MAID will never be an option. And I think for many of us as physicians, because we see our profession as being um, fundamentally about healing, not harming about relieving suffering, not increasing suffering. And in many ways, you know, people forget the consequences of MAID have, have increased suffering for not only the individual in some ways, um, and we could, there's some theological things that we could talk about there, but even to the family around them. Um, you know, when you take a 40 year old who, you know, has children, maybe some grandchildren, um, you know, has chronic pain, like I said, and she decides or he decides to end their lives, that's not necessarily end, you know, the end of the story when it comes to suffering, um, particularly for those um, involved in, in, in the family and in the community. So um, yes, to, to be very clear, I, I personally oppose it. I oppose it as a family physician. I oppose it as a, as a physician in general. And, and of course, I, I, I oppose it as a, as a Catholic. What would you say to critics who say, uh, who might uh, look at the interview and say, well, um, uh, of course, Dr. Hauptmann is going to say that because he's uh, a Catholic. So that uh, informs his um, viewpoint. Uh, well, I'm not Catholic. I, um, and so why uh, should this not be an option uh, for, for me? Because it's, it doesn't uh, conflict with my personal values because I don't have those. Well, I think this goes down then to, to what is a physician. And, and so this is of curious curiosity there. When I actually went into medicine, I actually had left my faith and I was an atheist. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so even when I went into this profession in the terms of, of helping people, um, that wasn't necessarily on my radar. But that being said, when I look at the discussion boards across Canada, many of the physicians who are involved in saying no, this is this is not where we want to see our profession go, are are people who don't have a faith just as much as there are people of faith, not only Christian faith but other faiths, who oppose this because they recognize that in a fundamental way, this changes how that physician patient relationship goes. And this is you know something I, I think people are a bit too um, flippant when saying oh it's just a person's right, just let them do it you have to really understand what this does to that relationship. If you as a patient do not believe that I will do everything in my power to relieve your pain and suffering, to help you along your journey, that's problematic because that trust, that trust is fundamental to the physician patient relationship. And this bill absolutely is destroying that trust because you know, if I'm a patient, you know, how do I know that doctor, you know, said, well, you know, we've done everything and, you know, it's been 90 days, you know, you should consider medical assistance and death. Really? Really? Is that, is that the best you had to offer me? 
you know, I think there's going to be problems here. I think there's going to be problems here. And this is why I think you see this, this um, kind of grassroots um, rejection or at least um, debate among physicians about um, how much concerns we have with this. Unfortunately, as an aside, many of our organizations that um, represent physicians have not responded well to that negativity from the profession. So organizations like the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Psych Psychiatric Association have basically kind of said, okay, well, yeah, let's go along with this. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? This is not representing me any longer. So I personally no longer belong to the Canadian Medical Association because of their stance on, on these issues. I, I know many psychiatrists who are considering um, leaving the Canadian Psychiatric Association over their stance on this issue. So, you know, our leaders in the profession and in our government are not necessarily representing um, the best interests, quite frankly, of physicians. And certainly they're not necessarily representing the best interests, well, you know, of our patients, in particular our patients with suffering, disability, mental health issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, would you... Would you say the same thing if uh, a close relative of yours was in a uh, um, situation where they are uh, um, suffering and, uh, you know, what if they, what if they pleaded with you, um, please um, uh, do this for me or, or make it, make it happen for me. I mean, is it, I guess what I'm getting at is it isn't it different if it happens to you personally, then it's not a theoretical discussion. It's, uh, uh, it's real. Yeah. Great questions. <clears throat> I, would, I would argue two points that. The, the first one is that it was always real for me when, I, when I've seen patients over the years, because I, I really am involved in my patient care. When I saw, see the suffering of people with chronic pain, the suffering of people with chronic illness, um, you know, I work so hard to get these people in the right direction because I really do feel their pain and, I, and I, I want them to have a better life. And I have been asked for, um, uh, you know, for the option of made for some of my patients in the past, particularly when I was doing chronic pain. And I've said, you guys, no, we can work through this. And, and I try to work with them through their journey and to provide them compassion, to provide them hope. So on the one side, you know, I, I do believe that, that, that those personal experiences do inform how I feel about made today. Now, as far as my own, you know, family members, I've actually had, you know, watched family members. Um, just recently, as about a couple of years ago now, I watched one of my uncles pass away from very severe um, Alzheimer's dementia um, in the Uville home here in St. Albert. And, you know, you know, he went on for many, many, many years. Um, and he's one of the sweetest guys, one of my favorite uncles. Um, but, you know, we, we, you know, he was loved, he was well cared for, and he looked, he was comfortable. And, you know, I never once, you know, thought it would be reasonable to offer um, my my uncle medical assistance in um, in dying, uh, or pardon me, I, I think it is again more apropos to call it medical assistance in death. So uh, again, I, maybe I'll, I'll continue to use that um, because there was so much, you know, love that we can offer him. Um, I think we 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 have to remember that suffering is a reality that we are all going to go through. And how we approach that as individuals and, and in a society will define us. And if we you know, treat suffering um, as something that is entirely unnatural, then we have to do absolutely everything we can to wipe it out. Or if we can't, then we end that life. We're, we're going down a pathway where I think, you know, I think John Paul II said it the best when he would, you know, call us a culture of death. I don't think we should be a culture of death. I think we should be a culture of life. We should be a culture of, 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 of love, of compassion. It's hard to walk through the journey of, of suffering with other people, but that's part of what makes us human beings. Where do you see um, um, this going? You know, I mean, all indications are that, uh, uh, Bill, uh, I mean, Bill C-7 is the first step on a, um, a journey uh, to making um, uh, made um, even more accessible to a wider range of people. 
I think this will ultimately go the way that the abortion debate went, unfortunately. And, and you know, if you may recall, many, many, many years ago, abortion was only for uh, situations in, in where the woman's life was was in danger. You had to have two doctors sign off on it. It was a very, um, um, you know, reasonably long process. It was well thought out, um, and it went from that to basically no abortion laws and anybody can get an abortion for whatever reason they want. I think, unfortunately, this is going to have to be made. It, it looks fine now. They talk about you have to go through a number of assessors and there's these waiting periods. Um, I think this is going to become medical assistance and death of demand. So whenever a patient wants it, um, there'll be little thought given to it. It will be seen as a, um, a right a person has to take their lives. And um, unfortunately, um, I think it is going to, it's going to head in that direction. I think though there's going to be a lot of pushback, uh, particularly from physicians, um, particularly people of goodwill who, who uh, uh, quite frankly, still had the same problems with the abortion debate. Uh, I think that we have to start creating, we're going back to, to really creating a culture of life. Um, and, and I think that's going to, you know, be very important. I think the, 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 the other debate that's going to be interesting in the next little while when it comes into this is going to be the con conscientious objection debates. Um, this is going to be huge. Um, I've, I've already made my personal stance that I would, you know, I can't believe I'm going to say this online, but, um, I'd rather lose my license than be involved in any of this procedure. And I will continue to, for my sake of my patients, uh, uh, vehemently promote, uh, uh, oppose anything that is going to, um, uh, you know, harm their health. And quite frankly, medical assistance in, de in death does harm their, their health. Um, so we have to have strong conscientious objections in place um, so that physicians like myself, physicians of goodwill, physicians who want to practice medicine like we were taught from the beginning. I mean, medicine is not a new, pr new practice. You can go all the way back to Hippocrates and the Hippoc Hippocratic Oath. We were not supposed to take life. We were not supposed to harm. To harm. And now within a, a matter of months, we're back to this thing of physicians, you know, being involved in taking, in taking someone's life. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I'm speechless, to be honest, at times when I, when I think how quickly this has changed the profession I have loved and served for 30 years. Um, could you not be, uh, I mean, now that MAID is the, is the law, could you not be sued by a patient because uh, uh, um, this is a, a, a legal pr uh, procedure in Canada and um, you're uh, not providing that procedure to, uh, to your patient? Well, I think this is a concern. And I think that goes back to my point about conscientious objection. Unless we uh, have very strong laws protecting the conscience of physicians practicing in Canada. Um, I think this is going to happen, and I think um, I think at the very least, I'm not sure that we'd see lawsuits as much as college complaints, which may in fact be worse than lawsuits, because um, a lawsuit only affects you financially. The colleges across Canada have the ability to take away your license. Um, so, uh, you know, will this happen? You know, it depends. Um, the Alberta College has been very respectful of trying to um, respect the conscientious rights of physicians in this province. Um, some of the other provinces, like Ontario, um, have not been as rigorous in their defense of conscientious um, objections. Uh, in particular, um, they feel, for example, that writing a referral letter for the May procedure is not... Um, unreasonable for family doctors, whereas many family doctors in the province said, no, we're not gonna do this. That's, that's still participating in the process. And that's, I would agree with that as well. I think writing a letter of referral is basically tantamount to saying, I, I support this procedure. So um, at least at this point, this is not being asked of us in this province, but certainly I think there's gonna come a point potentially where you will hear college complaints about physicians who will not offer this procedure. Um, but I've made it clear to my patients, I will not. When a new patient comes to my practice, they are given a, a, a welcome letter that basically explains there's these list of procedures that I will not provide. And if that's a problem, there's other physicians you can go to to get your medical care. 
Um, uh, what um, what can what can people do now? I mean, um, is it it's it's the law? Um, is it uh, is it not a a, a fait accompli? I mean, uh, prior to the passage of Bill C seven, there was this campaign um, by uh, the bishops and uh, um, doctors across the country and others a letter writing campaign to um, um, MPs and, uh, and and political leaders um, to stop the passage of Bill C seven. Uh, now that it's passed. Um, is that a, is that a failure? Well, I wouldn't say a failure. Um, I think what it shows is just how, um, much support there is for, um, people with disabilities, people with mental health, people with chronic illness. I mean, I think it's a good thing. We didn't all just come together and go, yeah, just, this past this year. We have come together and said, you know, a, a large swath of Canadians from all sorts of different, um, uh, professions and, and different backgrounds have said, no, um, you know, we want to support life. We want to support you. I mean, if I'm a patient with disability or mental health illness or suffering from chronic pain, and I know that there's this large group of people who want to support me. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So I think, you know, this has demonstrated just how much opposition now to your point, where do we go from here? And um, I know that there's organizations like there's a group I belong to called Canadian Physicians for Life. I know that they're going to continue to actively promote, um, you know, the support of people with chronic illness. Um, there's a Canadian Mental uh, Medical Dental Association I also belong with. I think this is this is an opportunity to start having those debates about what we can do to help people with suffering, um, and and provide patients and Canadians with the um with the evidence that there is solutions to suffering beyond medical assistance and death so i think we're gonna have to a lot of work here yes it's there it's part of the legislation um it is what it is i suppose but i think we now have an opportunity just like we did with abortion to go out there and, and speak truth and say you know what we want to support you we want to be there we want to love you there we want to start advocating for more services with people with chronic disabilities. We want to you know, start advocating for better mental health support. We want to start advocating for better treatment of chronic pain. This, is, this, is, this can be turned around to, to ho hopefully an opportunity. You're hopeful. I'm hopeful. Well, <laughs> that's, a, yeah, absolutely. Because um, isn't that the point? We want to be hopeful. And unfortunately, this is... Um, you know, I think where we find a lot of patients, they, they don't see that hope, but there's, there is hope. There's, there's hope for my profession. And now I'll give you my, my, my Christian side again. There's, there's hope in the faith and there's always a hope in the faith. And as a Catholic physician, every time I go to church and I'm on my knees and I look up the cross and I look at Jesus Christ and I look at the suffering he went through, I know, I know that there's, there's, there's hope in suffering. There's always a resurrection. There's always a savior who's going to walk that journey with me. So um, we got to we got to we got to get our patients in this um, because, as I said, suffering is inevitable. How we deal with suffering—that's an interesting thing. But we can't ignore the fact that all of us will will suffer. And when we enter that journey, whenever that journey is going to be, do we want a healthcare professional, a healthcare community, a medical community that's going to walk that journey with us, give us hope, give us compassion? Or do we want a medical community that's going to say, hey, you know, we've, we've got this here, this, this, this way out for you. You might as well go take it. And I don't, I, that's not the medical community I want. Thank you so much. Those are, uh, those are all my questions. Um, Rob, is there anything else that, you'd, uh, that you want to add? No, I, I think this okay. was a lovely interview. And Andrew, I'm sorry again if I uh, went, uh, my wife would accuse me of going long-winded at times. <laughs> Not at all. So, that if, if, if I will, but uh, um, definitely it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We've got a lot of work to do in uh, promoting a culture of, of, of life again. And uh, this is just another, um, another uh, road in the journey. It's, uh, we've got to take up our cross. What did Jesus say, right? You've got to deny yourself, take up your cross daily. So this is what we have to do. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, really, really enjoyed the discussion. And, and um, again, um, uh, you know, how we 
uh, how we purpose this. Um, we're still um, in the process of determining that, but I'll uh, I'll be in touch um, uh, probably early next week. Any other questions that come up, or as we go along, I, I, I mean, you know, it may, it may not be the um, I don't know if I'm the best media person um, per se, but I do enjoy uh, speaking. I have strong opinions on these things, and I'd be happy to speak with you again at any time. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good Bye -bye. weekend. You too. Bye-bye.